Hey guys, it's SD, your host of the Life Fix Relationship Podcast, where people with all sorts of backgrounds, challenges, and life experience show us how they make their relationship extraordinary. Hey guys, hope you're having an awesome day and enjoy the previous episode with Alex where we discussed how a half black, half white man was able to not only marry a Korean woman, but also have an amazing relationship with her. Today we are speaking to the founder of Essentialized Workplace Wellbeing and environmental psychologist Lee Chambers. Thank you so much, Lee, for being here. I'm super excited to start speaking to you. You want to start by telling us a bit of your background, your story, and how you got into the work that you're doing today. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see. It's a bit of a journey, but yeah, thanks for having me on to share it. So yeah, I grew up in the north of England. Uh, blue collar family first one in my whole extended family to go to university and that was great but it was challenging at the same time I had some mental health struggles in the middle of my time at university uh, struggled making that transition between being an adolescent and being an adult didn't have the self-awareness and emotional intelligence to dig that bit deeper Uh, and that actually led to me coming out of university being taken home by my parents and being actually given some space outside of all the pressures of society to really sit back and reflect and start to understand who I was. And that really started my journey of developing and growing uh, through failure, through suffering, through challenge. Uh, I went back to university and graduated 2007 and start to really get an anchor on what do I bring to the world? What do I enjoy? Two things stand out, understanding people and helping people and figures, statistics, and algorithms and patterns. So I put them two together. I wanted to be a financial advisor. I could help people with a financial well-being and help people get compounding interest, get the best rates, get the best uh, outcomes for them. Except going into this in the fall of 2007, not a great time to go into finance. <laughs> so six months hard work, uh, get made redundant and lose all my funding from professional training. And that is very much a, a difficult time because I'm not from and background of advantage and I had to go home and try again to work out what I was going to do in my life and that set me on a real journey then. I set up a video game business, I went to work in local government, the video game business uh, rocketed, it took off, went to six figures very quickly, kept doubling in revenue that gave me the flexibility, the time, the resources to start doing qualifications in sleep, nutrition, movement and psychology to expand on my degree and also then took me into elite sports for a time and took me into the charity sector where I was able to help people and start to feel just how fulfilling that was. In 2014, feeling like life was comfortable and everything was great. I'd met my wife and had my son. Uh, I suddenly lost the ability to walk for illness and my worldview was changed and I had to again go back to the beginning and really start to unpack what my purpose was, really get deep on my values while I learned to walk again. And that's kind of all taken me today because that process of learning to walk again and get my health back on track, what it really did is made me realise that I really need to help people and help people through challenge like I've been through challenge. And I can leverage all my qualifications to do that along with my lived experience, my industrial knowledge and the life that I've lived. And that has become essentialised where now help both people and companies to basically take health behaviour seriously, find ways to embed it, find ways to help people to really get more from their lives, both in terms of how they communicate, how they look after themselves, and how they ultimately navigate the world, their own self-awareness, but also looking at things such as sleep and nutrition and habits so people can make small changes in their lives that will make a big change in the future. Wow, you went through a whole lot. What would you say is the thing that helped you actually pull through all those challenges? So if anything, you don't really understand and appreciate how resilient you are as a human being until you hit challenges and you hit failures. And I think the biggest thing for me when it's come to kind of alchemizing my way through those is that when this initially happens to you, feels like a threat to your existence, a threat to your freedom, a threat to your health. But the truth is, it's actually a challenge for you to step into. And if you take ownership over not what's happened, because so often that's out of your control, but take ownership over the outcomes, ownership over how you're going to move forward, because we can always respond. No matter what happens, we have an opportunity to respond in that situation. And when I got taken home from university, that was the first time in my life I'd really fallen into a hole 
and I just divided everything. I started to isolate myself. I'd actually been taken home because I isolated myself in my university dorm for two weeks, missing work, missing university, missing all social events and not speaking to anybody that I knew. And realising that that avoidance, it had just amplified my issues. If I'd approached them and been had that bit of courage to step out there, outside my comfort zone a bit, and say, I'm struggling, I need some help, I'd have found that people were willing to listen. I would have found that I would have been able to work through it and that's really the biggest takeaway in that I've had challenges since the redundancy, the health issues. But what I've found is even when I've had challenges in my relationships, the ability to accept that things are as they are, there's accept that there's certain things that you can't change, but actually building that self-awareness to realize that you're going to have challenges in life. Adversity doesn't discriminate. There is no perfect life. And when you're in those little holes that you're going to fall into, as long as you keep looking upwards to the next mountain you're going to climb, you'll still have the hope and optimism to climb up. And if you can see it as a challenge to step into, you'll start stepping out of your hole back up to that next mountain to really your potential, your growth and where you want to be. Yeah, exactly. Do you think that this mindset has helped your marriage? Um, It certainly has in its own way because what it's done is it's made me more self-aware and by being more self-aware and being able to accept how my wife is means that I have, I don't do what a lot of people unfortunately do and try and desire to change elements of the other person because at the end of the day, we all have our own unique individual perception and perspective on life and truth be told, when you become more self-aware, you become more accepting of other people because you become more accepting of yourself. You start to actually see how sometimes the things that trigger you in your relationships are actually a representation of your own inner beliefs and your own self-talk and some of the things that actually are traits in yourself that you don't like or recognize. But what you actually do is you mirror that if someone shows that to you and it triggers you because it's you who's triggered not them who has triggered you. And once you become more self-aware and understand, actually, there's a chance to step into that gap instead of reacting initially and feeling that you've been wronged, feeling that you have not been listened to, feeling you have not been this. There's actually a little gap there for you to just think, okay, so why is that the case? And then that allows you to, instead of reacting, which so often spirals into conflict, and puts other people into a reactive state, which is always a really difficult place to be in a relationship if you're both in a reactive state, because you'll become defensive, you'll become more argumentative, and you'll not be able to see rational reason, and you'll lose sight of not only the person that you're with, but also yourself. If you're able to actually take that breath and take that second, step into that gap and respond, you can actually choose an empowered response, which will not only help you, but it will help your partner as well. Yep. Now, I'm curious, how did you go from wanting to be a financial advisor to studying all things about health? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting consideration because I've always had a certain interest in how things work. So my underlying uh, message from my childhood was Lee was curious. He's disruptive. He's not just willing to have it be as it is, that that is the answer. He wants to know why it's the answer. He wants to know what else affects it. So that kind of interconnected mindset that I've got, finance was great in a way to have that pattern, those patterns, those numbers. But the helping people started to make me understand, actually, to help people effectively, I need to understand how I work. And if I understand how I work, I can help people understand how they work. That set me on the mission to try and understand my own health, my own physiology, my own psychology. Because I was like, if I'm to help other people, that's great. But I need to be a a level seven person to help the level five people become other level seven people as well. And that's how it catalyzed in my own little gamified mind. But what I actually realized is these things are so interconnected. And I've got a real like bugbear for the fact that, you know, modern medicine, for example, really wants to isolate down on one symptom and fix it. But then there's a reason why there's 10 side effects. It's because we're massively interconnected in so many different ways. And as I've started to kind of expand that and realize actually I needed to know quite a bit about nutrition. I needed to know a lot about sleep. 
I needed to know about movement. I needed to know about psychology. I needed to understand about neuroscience and mindset. And suddenly I've done like seven different high level qualifications in different scientific modalities. But what you start to see is there's lots of interlinking threads. It's like one big web and being able to see that has given me a certain clarity on the fact that nothing is as simple as we imagine it is, but it is easier to actually do lots of simple little actions across that web. And gradually over time, all those webs start to meet. And suddenly what you end up with is a really big net that allows you to go out in the world and catch lots of interesting things, but also to be able to let a lot of the noise go through the gap, but you'd be able to catch in the net the things that actually matter. And I suppose that's almost how it's alchemized in my own mind. But yeah, the interconnected aspects of health and well-being are absolutely vital because ultimately we're our biggest experiment, we're the biggest project we'll ever have in our lives. And so many of us are just walking through life, not really understanding how any of this works. And that's absolutely vital because from a relationship perspective, I always say that ultimately for someone to say, I love you, you need to understand that I. <laughs> And if you've got an understanding of that, then you're able to express it to other people and you're able to be authentically you and be loved for who you are. And ultimately, when we don't have that un deeper understanding of ourselves and of just how we can look after ourselves, because our own self-care is the self-care of others, because you can't give to other people from an empty cup. Yes, exactly. I love your mindset because I'm also way too curious. <laughs> I mean, I think curiosity is like a really great thing because that's the only way we learn and we get to know new things and how things work. I'm so glad I'm speaking with you. Probably also while you were studying all those different subjects, a lot of it overlapped, even just like on the basic level. So without even getting so complicated, you could see how it's all intertwined. Okay, so why is it so important to be vital and healthy and have optimum well-being in life and how does that affect your relationship? So what I find is that in terms of my own understanding, one of the biggest factors that affects relationship is sleep. So people quite often are slightly confused by that, but then you explain it to them in a simple way, like imagine the toddler who's ready for a nap and he is not behaving. But his parents say, oh, he's not slept well last night and he needs a nap. That's why his behaviour is erratic. That's why he's running about. That's why he won't comply to any kind of demand, even reasonable ones. And the truth be told, there's lots and lots of adults across the world running around like that toddler. And when we don't sleep, it affects our hormonal and emotional regulation also affects our attention and concentration. And what that does is it means we're more likely to make mistakes. It means we're more likely to swing from emotional states. The problem is that it has a tendency to cause conflict because people swing more wildly. People become more defensive. People become more negative of other people, more judgmental and more stereotypical and they become less self-aware, less connected to themselves because the hormonal regulation swings now, the issue with that is it then impacts a lot of other things. People don't eat as well when their sleep is poor, the quality or the quantity. So they tend to migrate towards foods that spike blood sugar levels that don't nourish. And that also causes them to very quickly become very energetic and then drop off badly on the other side of the cliff. Uh, what that does is it makes them lethargic and then they're less likely to want to interact with other people on a more fulfilling level. And then they're less likely to move around. And the problem is that movement gives us, you know, neurotransmitters that are positive and makes us more resilient to challenge. By not moving around as much, all of a sudden, our mood is lower and we're less resilient to facing feedback from other people, which then feels more like criticism, which then leads to people becoming defensive and leads to people then behaving erratically again. And to understand, like, ultimately why it's interesting because from a psychological perspective we have a negativity bias negative thoughts and negative experiences stick to our brains like velcro and that's important because it wasn't that long ago that if we were walking around in the night we would pray to all the other animals on the planet that would happily eat us so we had to be alert and very switched on to negative if we were too busy looking at the pretty flowers we were going to get eaten and what that actually means is from a negativity perspective we tend to quite often turn things and see the negative both in terms of how we talk to ourselves and how we then express that to others except in a strange way we'll actually talk very negative to ourselves 
we won't actually express that to other people in the same way. And Why is that? It's because, interestingly, as soon as we articulate or write something down, it makes it much more real than your own self-talk. And all of a sudden, you hear those words and it triggers emotions. You say something and you feel disgust. You actually feel, whoa, what have I just said? You catch yourself. But the beauty is we can tell ourselves and play mental movies in our minds over and over again of things that we wouldn't choose to watch and we just let them play and play and play. And then wonder why we feel that way. Wonder why we have beliefs that hold us back, boundaries and limits that stop us reaching our potential. And then you understand that actually it all comes back round. Sleep, nutrition, mindset, movement and habits are massively interconnected. If we make small changes in all of those, they pull each other up together to really put us on an upward spiral, which then allows us to give people more because we then start to practice things like gratitude. We start to practice things like kindness. And by doing that, we suddenly build relationships that are built on something that is positive. The beauty of that is the more we practice those, the more we see, the more capacity we have, and the more we can give. And all of a sudden, when you build that culture of gratitude, that culture of kindness, that culture of you know social connection and care for others, and a massive part of my work with Essentialize in the workplace is helping people to lead with love, because really, it's the secret to leadership. And when I go into a boardroom and say, leadership with love, and that's what we're going to talk about today, you should see people's faces, but they leave that room understanding that as a leader, it's your responsibility to lead yourself first. So you need to show other people that they can lead too. That's your job as a leader. But ultimately, you need to love what you're doing. You need to love the people you're doing it with. And you need to love helping other people to become and reach their potential. And that, in all truth, is what a leader is. And the beauty is that everyone is a leader. It doesn't matter if you're leading a company, leading an organisation, a club, a family, or just yourself on an everyday basis, because everyone is a leader. And if you can lead yourself with love, your company with love, your family with love, then all of a sudden, those relationships bloom. Yeah. Okay. So we see that sleep is so important and it affects everything else. What tips would you give to someone who wants to improve their sleep? Yeah. So, so many people will already have a generally good idea of number one, what's probably taken away from the sleep and number two, what they should probably do. And really my main tips to start to look at the parts of your day that you can control. So that's usually your morning and your evening because most people's working hours or school hours, or some kind of societal expectation that during the middle of the day, they've not got control over it. So we actually start to look at what can you do in the morning to help you sleep in the evening? Well, researchers have shown that if you can try to reduce the amount of inputs you have in the morning, so when you wake up, maybe meditate or sit in silence or go for a walk, do something that isn't putting you straight into a stimulated state straight away. So you can spend the first hour of your day reading, listening to a podcast, I'd suggest 10 minutes of this podcast every day for a week. You'll get an insight to take every day into your relationships, an actionable thing you can try and just look at the difference that I'd make over a few weeks. And in terms of the PM routine, we all know that ultimately there's things that we should have curfews on. Caffeine exists in our system for up to eight hours. It's got a long half-life. So try to keep your caffeine before 2 p.m. and you'll definitely sleep better. Alcohol affects our sleep quality. It affects our sleep cycles. And even though it might feel like it makes you drop off quicker, it actually will cause you to, you know, more, much more likely to wake up during the night and much more likely for your sleep cycles to be disrupted. So probably have that, you know, not, not in the four hours before you go to bed. Sit similar for big meals. When you're putting all the energy into digestion, it's harder for your body to drop its core body temperature because that's what you do when you fall asleep. Your core body temperature drops by a few degrees. So big meals don't make that particularly easy. Also, they take a lot of energy, so they don't allow your body to regenerate as quickly. Similar for exercise. If you intensely exercise, your core body temperature rises. Your body has to fight a lot to bring it down. So it's best not to exercise too close to bedtime if you can avoid it. And sometimes it's just important if we can journal our mind, and take our mind, put it on paper in the evening. That's quite powerful. And a big relationship tip that I often bring is decide with your partner at a point where you're not going to talk about emotionally charged issues. Because in the world that we live in, so many couples are really, really busy and suddenly they fall into bed at the end of the day having barely spoken 
and then they bring out their grievances, their frustrations on each other. And those emotionally charged topics are really not great for your, you know, autonomous nervous system at bedtime. Because if you start, you know, building those emotions that you're going to struggle to express in a healthy way, when you're lying in bed, you're going to have a disturbed night's sleep. And that's never a good way to then wake up in the morning in a refreshed state to tackle the day in a positive way again. So do you agree with never go to sleep angry or not? So I don't think you should put yourself in a high arousal state before you go to sleep. So what if you're already in a fight? Yeah. To be honest, probably the best thing to do would be to remove yourself temporarily from the atmosphere and do something which for you is a relaxation technique. For, so for some people that are sitting in silence, some people, you can really utilize the breath to take deep breaths in down to your stomach. Probably if, uh, you know, like I do a five second inhale, hold for two, exhale for eight, do that five or six times. And all of a sudden your body just reacts. It just understands that this is a, this is a message because ultimately high arousal state such as negative ones such as anger positive ones such as excitement they actually manifest in a very similar way that anxiety of going out on stage to talk or the excitement of winning an award they both have you behind the stage butterflies sweating and really they're great when we want to go out and perform they are great when we want to you know really push on at bedtime you want to be in a low arousal state and you know what that's a long long way from anger to go from angry to calm it's challenging but you can almost start to try and you know get your body and your physiology in a more relaxed state you gradually pull yourself down a little bit because again you don't want to be stimulated when you're trying to switch off because really when we go to bed what we're doing is we're switching off all that and in a world where we're bombarded it's actually so important that we try to disconnect at that time for bed because what it what it does is it just puts us in a state where we can regenerate more because if you go to bed really, really angry, your body's still processing. It's still spinning at such a speed that by the time you finally slow down, you'll have lost out on a little bit of that recovery. And sleep is where we really, we grow. We get everything back. Sleep affects every biological process in your body. So we should try to do everything we can to ensure that it, you know, it's giving us the vitality to go and tackle the following day. Yeah. And like you said earlier, the excitement and the nervousness is the same thing. That's how you could transfer, go from being really nervous and I guess force yourself, or I don't know what the right word would be, is mm-hmm. to become really excited because it's the same thing and channel it differently. And it- yeah. And funnily enough, it's much easier to go from high rails on negative to high arousal positive than it is to go from high arousal negative to low arousal positive which is why sometimes people telling you calm down when you're angry is like red rag to a bull because that's so far away and even your most zen buddhist master can struggle to do that because the, the polar opposite and we're not designed to suddenly switch off because what would happen in the, the wider scheme of things as human beings if we could do that we'd run away from the saber tooth tiger and then there'd just be a point where we're like oh it's fine and then you get eaten so we're designed to high arousal state for long enough to survive in really really challenging situations which makes us incredibly resilient our physiology changes in those you know our blood thickens in case we take damage our eyesight becomes more you know more clear and more we get a wider view we get more clarity and all of a sudden all these activations happen in our body to allow us to react to allow us to you know become that cutting edge of performance but you don't want that at bedtime and there's there's times and places for that and really when it comes to our emotions in relationship if we can become more self-aware and start to find ways to more healthily express the negative emotions because we shouldn't suppress them it's important that we actually find a way to express them and start to explore them. Because unfortunately, in a lot of relationships where people suppress those negative emotions, they compound as well, they build up, and suddenly people start to resent each other. Suddenly people honestly start to become, you know, regretful about the choices. And it's not necessarily the other person. 
sometimes it's just the fact that they've suppressed their negative emotions for so long it's become a burden on the back which they're struggling to carry and sometimes they then look to the other person to shoulder some of that burden and they're not necessarily going to understand if you've not been expressing that which is why communication is so vital the ability to actually talk and the ability to actually listen to each other and start to hear what's being said because we can't jump into anyone else's brain and understand and look through their eyes i wish <laughs> it would be it would be amazing because we'd suddenly see just how different someone's perception is because we already know that you know so there could there could be something will happen to someone one person will react with shock the other person won't react at all and sometimes something will happen and someone will actually be like oh well that's that's a good thing that that's happened another person will be like this is terrible and that variance makes us an incredibly diverse and interesting species because if we all saw the everything the same way what an awful world that would be <laughs> and and yet the beauty is sometimes that like for me and my wife, it's really interesting because she's very black and white with a lot of things. I'm very, very much, let's look at all the shades of grey. And that sometimes when it's synergized together can be really powerful because suddenly we've got very clear black and white and lots of clarity in the middle. But it does mean that sometimes I'm just like, I can't, I can't, I can't catalyze, I can't understand that. Like, it's not just that or that. What about this? <laughs> and it's just that finding ways to actually often combine your perception because then you've got the perception of two people and suddenly you can start to get some colour in that black and white. And that's really powerful because, again, when you're together, really, relationships, you should be looking to amplify each other. You're a team. You're not just a group when you're together. And groups just have their own values and they might have one mission together as a group, but they're not bound by anything. They're still walking off in their own directions. And when you're together, you're interdependent on each other. And when you understand that interdependence can actually be a force for good and you can actually push each other on, all of a sudden you actually make progress together totally so how has your marriage affected what you do oh it's massive because when we met i was in that phase of building the business and working in local government and initially i was i was obviously at this point doing qualifications well and i was very busy and still quite tunnel visioned because a big part of my business back then was fueled off the frustration of being made redundant and fueled off the frustration of being told that I probably would struggle to go into the video game wholesaling market because I was young, disruptive, diverse, and just a bit rough around the edges. So what that actually did is it put me on a little pathway where I wasn't the self-aware, but what I was, it was incredibly determined to prove a point. And what that did is it blinkered my approach. So I wasn't anywhere near as self-aware when we met. So I was a little bit like, you know, maybe you should look to change these things because, you know, I think that that's the way it should be. And looking back now, it's horrifying. But again, if you can look back and feel a bit like you've, you've changed, then that's good because you've actually made some development. <laughs> but the real turning point was when I became a father. And that really changed me because all of a sudden you've got responsibility and you've got to become more self-aware. And obviously having my son was really important to me and made me just start to look at all the relationships in my life and start to see that maybe I was just being too individualistic about things. I was being too dogmatic. I wasn't being open enough. When I became well, my wife was six months pregnant with my daughter. My son was 18 months old. And over the course of five days, I went from fully mobile, fully independent, to stuck in a hospital bed, unable to move. My wife, who was still working at the time, was coming after work, six months pregnant, to help me shower, to help me eat, to help me do the basic things. And when you have everything stripped away, and the people that love you are there to help you do the basic things, giving their time and their energy through all these challenges. If nothing makes it clearer that you've not been as grateful as you should have been, it's that. And I sat there and realised my wife moved back in with her parents so her parents, my in-laws, could look after our son while she helped me. The corner of care for me suddenly grew. It was much more than just my wife, but my wife was the pivot point in it all. Without her, 
who knows whether I'd have even got anywhere near the chance to recover and be able to do the work that I do today. So when you, I start to kind of understand that, it you know it, it brings you to tears because you don't really take the people around you and understand the time and the energy until for so many people you're in your moment of need and then these people stand up and you honestly feel that you don't deserve it because you've not lived and been congruent with the fact that you should be incredibly grateful for the people that you have and my recovery and my ability to get walking again was all down to the people around me and so often I tell people my story and they're like, oh, Lee, you're so inspirational. Oh, Lee, you've gone through all this adversity. How did you do it? The reality is that, yeah, I had a mindset that was proactive and took ownership, but without the people around me, I'm not the man that I am. And really, I'm the man that I am today because of my wife, because of my children, because of my in-laws. They have given me the ability to recover and build what I've built today. But they give me the platform to build my self-awareness and but the people listening who have those moments about their partners and their families, be grateful for them because there will be a time in your life when you need them. And if you treat them with respect, if you take them on the journey with you, if you open your eyes to more than your own desires, and they will be there in your moment of need. Wow. How were you able to deal with that whole emotion? First, there was the crashing, losing your ability to walk and to do so many things. And then at the same time, you have that gratitude that you have for all the people around you. It's like high and lows. Yeah, well, what it kind of was is it's a process. So when I first went into hospital, this had happened over the course of five days. So initially, I felt nothing. I was in complete shock and a lot of pain because my knees were like footballs, my shoulder was by my ear, and my wrist was locked in place because my immune system had attacked the tissue inside my joints and inflamed them to the point where they'd grown to double the size. And it was incredibly painful. I didn't know how to process it at first. It felt like a flash and suddenly I'd gone from this to this, like independence gone. But after that initial shot wore off, I had the general human thoughts you would have around this frustration and despair i'm 29 i've got a young family why me why now never been in hospital before until this happened i looked after myself i was in good health i'd always made an effort to you know ensure that i was doing all the things that they say that you should do exercising eating well sleeping enough and for this to come it just felt like a really big kick in the face at the same time then that kind of passed and I knew from my challenge at university, express this as healthily as you can. Speak to people about how you feel, but be objective. Don't let it pollute every other area of your life, but more certainly, don't just bottle it up and pretend you're fine because that will come back. So I kind of moved through that and by expressing that to the people that came and visited, to the nurses, and just really taking that time to understand it myself, using my self-awareness to just process, you know, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. You get a lot of time to reflect when you can't move. But I kind of moved into a bit of grief. So then I'm starting to feel, am I going to walk again? My physicality, my athletic ability as a young man, not, I put some value on that, but I'm not really sure what's going to come of that. And I'm going to be able to play with my children and these kind of thoughts that go through your head. And again, I, I knew I had to let that come, express that, find a way to make it work and make it understandable. And by approaching them and letting those thoughts come into me, kind of pass through, I was then able to find a bit of peace. And that took two weeks. I was in hospital for four weeks. So after those first two weeks, I'd gone through that whole cycle and I got moved up onto a, a ward, a longer term ward in the hospital, higher up. And I was next to a window overlooking some fields. And those fields looked across to the village where I was born. And I've walked across those fields many times. And just looking out that window, I started to realise that number one, I'd never been grateful for walking until I lost it. And I'd walked over those fields, you know, 10, 20 times, never ever been grateful until I lost it. And that's what really expanded my gratitude because then I realized I hadn't been grateful enough to the people around me. And I hadn't even been grateful enough for the life that I had because I might have lost the ability to walk at this moment in time. I might have lost my independence through doing simple daily tasks. But look at the life that I've had so far. 
the people that I've had the pleasure to meet, the people in my life. The, I've, ne I've never been through conflict, environmental disaster, famine, none of that. I've had free education and free healthcare. I've had the freedom to set up a business, working in a number of different industries. And I've got a family who care. You can't put a value on that. And all of a sudden, that's what really expanded my gratitude. I had to go through and process the negative emotion, find the treasure on the other side. Okay, one more thing before I let you go. How do you keep the balance between raising your kids and at the same time not trying to change them like you don't want to change anyone else? It's always such a challenging one, but a big part of it is I think so many parents, they want the children to be perfect. And it's only natural that we want to try and raise a child that's well behaved and a child that, you know, excels in education. Or a child that really does, you know, does doesn't and changes the world and does amazing things. But the truth is, really, our job as a parent is to equip our children, encourage them, and empower them to become the adults who they are. And it's only it's only natural that some of who they are is going to be rubbed off from us. It's going to be rubbed off from society. It's going to be rubbed off from the peer group, and it's going to be rubbed off from their young experiences. But it's so vital that we understand that when you've got a toddler and they've got the hands all over the toilet seat there's a time to tell them that's not a good idea this is why when they get a little bit older and all of a sudden they do things that don't necessarily put them in you know in danger not in acute danger and you've got to let them embrace that curiosity ask those questions be disruptive occasionally as long as it's not adversely affecting lots of other people you've got to allow them to be able to express themselves without suppressing it because you don't think it's the way they should be the way that you want them to be because ultimately they are not you and they have their own perspective and perception of the world and the beauty is that children have such clarity they don't have that awful societal baggage that we have as adults. They see things, they're able to navigate conversations. They are actually able to go into a boardroom and roast a bunch of CEOs, no problem at all, because they will pick things apart. They're observant, they see. They will call you a hypocrite if you say one thing and do another. And the really, more, the really, uh, the really important thing is the best thing for you to do is not to tell them, but to show them, to show them that you're congruent as a parent, that what you say, what you ask them to do, and what you do, all stem from those values. And that is again self awareness, because you can set limiting beliefs on your children by the words that you use, the expression and tone that you confer things. And you can so easily say to your child, oh, you're good at that, you're clever. And that sets them into a frame that that's what they're good at. And then they'll think that if they don't do good at it, then they're a failure. And then they'll think that, well, because I'm good at this, I'll, I'm weak at this. And they won't try at that thing, even if it's the thing that they most want to do. And it's so easily done. And the truth is there is no perfect parenting. But if you can connect with your children, start to see things through their little eyes and start to just be a bit more mindful of how you approach their life and let them express themselves. Give them the space, keep them safe, but let them experiment. Because if they can experiment, they will learn so much. They will find their own path. And by the time they're an adult, they will thank you because they will ultimately be your friend because you've given them the space to be the human that they are and they will forever thank you for that space and that opportunity of someone to model in their own way. I love that. Thank you so, so much, Lee. It was awesome speaking to you. And guys, if you want to hear more about Lee's awesome work, you can go to leechambers.org. I'm going to put all his links to this website and all social media handles in the show notes. Did you enjoy that episode? Could you do me a personal favor and subscribe and leave a review? It would mean a lot to me. Thank you so much and have an awesome day. Thank you.